I'm Bob Rubin, and my sole assignment is to welcome all of you to today's Hamilton Project discussion of food security. Having said that, let me make two comments. Number one, the Hamilton Project began about 10 years ago, and our purposes from the beginning were to support policy development around the country and to promote seriousness of purpose in policy dialogue. And I think those purposes, policy development and, and most particularly, seriousness of purpose in policy dialogue, have become ever more important as the policy, what goes for policy dialogue, what was considered policy dialogue in our country has descended ever more into ideology, into politics, into partisanship. And our commitment is to try to do our little part in keeping alive that seriousness of purpose. Secondly, from the beginning, our bedrock objectives with respect to economic policy have been growth, broad-based participation in the benefits of growth, and economic security, and is our view that they are interdependent and that they can reinforce each other. In that context, food insecurity, in this the richest country in the world, is not only morally wrong, but it is also a serious impediment to economic growth. Sufficient nutrition is a requisite for productivity and for productive engagement in the workforce, and therefore for realizing the full productivity potential of our economy. And when food insecurity affects children, which, as you'll see in the Hamilton Project facts, which we handed out as you came in, is happening far too frequently in this country, we are reducing the prospects for our economy for decades ahead as well, as I said earlier, uh, being involved with a, a morally outrageous situation for this, the richest country in the world. Today's discussion is about the startling number of people who are still experiencing food insecurity in America today. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, which is designed, as you well know, to address this issue and recommended policy changes to make that program more effective. Let me recognize Diane Schonsenbach, the director of the Hamilton Project, on leave from Northwestern University to head our project, to direct our project. Kristen McIntosh, the managing director of the Hamilton Project. And Ryan Nunn, the policy director of the Hamilton Project, for the work that they have done in creating the intellectual construct for this meeting and also in developing logistics for our meeting. We will begin with Diane framing the discussion and also discussing the Hamilton fact sheet, which I, I mentioned before, which I think you'll find both interesting and deeply troubling in terms of the magnitude of the problem that this country is experiencing in terms of food insecurity. And then we'll turn to an exchange between our two distinguished discussants, Tom Vilsack, the outstanding Secretary of Agriculture through both terms of President Obama's administration, and the former governor of the state of Ohio, of Iowa, rather. Oh, Ohio's a nice state, too. I, well, I used to think so. But anyway, <laughs> Iowa's a nice state, too. Ohio, rather. Anyway, it's governor of the state of Ohio. And Bob Greenstein, founder and president of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And Bob is that unusual person who is both a fervent advocate for policies to help the poor and also a very serious budget analyst. I first got to know Bob in the beginning of the Clinton administration when President Clinton and Gene Sperling said, this is a man who cares enormously about the poor, but also really understands the pragmatics of our budget and is serious about dealing with both. I thank them for joining us, and I greatly look forward to this discussion. Diane, the program is yours. Thank you. I'd like to also welcome you to the Hamilton Project's conversation on food insecurity and policies to alleviate it. I'm going to st set the stage right now to describe the extent of the problem and also some potential solutions. And this comes from our document that we've released today, 12 Facts About Food Insecurity and SNAP, released today by the Hamilton Project. In 
2014, one in seven households were food insecure, meaning that at some point during the year, they had difficulty providing enough food for all of their members due to a lack of resources. 15 million children, or one in five children in the United States, lived in food insecure households. Even more troubling, in 2014, one in 20 households experienced very low food security, meaning that they suffered one or more periods during the year in which food intake of household members was reduced, or normal eating patterns were disrupted because of lack of money for food. As you can see in the chart here, the rate of food insecurity across children, adults, or the elderly, all three spiked during the Great Recession, and they remain elevated today. In every state, a higher share of children than adults live in food insecure households. As you can see from this map, in every state, more than one in 10 children lives in a food insecure household. In nine states, the share is one in four children living in a food insecure household. Let me tell you more about the characteristics of these food insecure households with children. The vast majority of food insecure households with children are working households. 85% of households with children who reported food insecurity also reported at least one earner in 2014. Also note that these food insecure households are slightly more likely to be married, headed by a married couple than by a single mother. Another fact about food insecure households is that households with a teenager are more likely to suffer food insecurity. What many parents know uh, from their own experience is also true empirically. Teenagers eat more and they cost more to feed. It's true. Uh, spending on food increases when there's a teenager in the house. Unfortunately, food assistance benefits do not increase commensurately. SNAP benefits don't change. And in fact, teenagers are less likely to participate in school meals programs. This adds up to significantly higher rates of both food insecurity and very low food security status among households with teenagers. Furthermore, the snapshot view, that annual rate of food insecurity that I started with, masks the extent of the problem, because many families cycle in and out of food insecurity across consecutive years. When we compare households that are food insecure this year to the share that were food insecure this year or last year, the Hamilton Project calculates that about 40% more households were food insecure across the, at one point across the two-year period than were food insecure this year. Please note that even temporary periods of food insecurity may cause lasting negative impacts on children. Furthermore, troublingly, the rate of food insecurity extends even higher up in the income distribution than you might think. Fully a third of food insecure households have annual incomes that are more than twice the poverty line. That is more than uh, $48,000 a year for a family of four. Uh, this is generally above the reach of social safety net programs like SNAP, subsidized school meals, and the Earned Income Tax Credit. Another third of food insecure households have incomes between one and two times the poverty line. Note here in the light green that very low food security status that, um, you know, when, uh, when families experience hunger or things related to that, shown in the light green here, is much more concentrated among the very poor. Fortunately, a robust social safety net can really help alleviate these problems. In 2012, which is the most recent year available, after adjusting for survey underreporting, we find that SNAP lifts 10 million people out of poverty, including nearly 5 million children. This impact is nearly equivalent to the combined income, uh, impact of the EITC and the child tax credit. Researchers are just starting to understand the magnitude of the importance of these programs, especially on the long-term well-being of children. In a study published this month in the American Economic Review, my co-authors and I follow the cohorts that were children when SNAP, then called the Food Stamp Program, was originally introduced as part of the War on Poverty. Because the program was rolled out on a county-by-county -county basis over a relatively long period of time, we can compare otherwise similar children living in neighborhood, neighboring counties within the same, same state and at different ages who had different, differed in their access to the program. And then we can trace the impact of access to this program across the children's lifespan now that they're adults. We find that children who had access to the then food stamp program, today SNAP, were 18 percentage points more likely to graduate from high school. In adulthood, those with childhood access were healthier as measured by their likelihood of being obese, having diabetes or heart disease, and related measures. Women, in particular, saw improvements from the program with an increase in their adult economic outcomes, including employment, earnings, and related measures. 
As a result, we argue that SNAP should be thought of an, as an investment in children and not merely charity. There are many things that we can do to improve the reach of our existing food support programs. I look forward to the conversation between Bob Greenstein and Secretary Vilsack that will explore some of these. For example, there are many children who are food insecure and are eligible for programs like School Meals, WIC, and SNAP, but for some reason are not participating. We also have evidence that increases in benefits can substantially benefit impa uh, impact food security. For example, it's long been known that children's food insecurity and very low food security status spikes when school is not in session. The Department of Agriculture recently fielded a pilot program with an exceptionally strong research design component to test how additional summer feeding benefits would impact food insecurity. The results are important and they are large. A $60 monthly food voucher over the summer reduced food insecurity among children by 20% and very low food security status by 30%. Finally, evidence also shows that SNAP improves the broader financial well-being of households, not only reducing their food insecurity, but by shoring up their resources available for food, it also helps, it reduces the likelihood that a household will fall behind on major expenses, like housing or utility. Households are also less likely to skip a needed trip to the doctor when they have access to SNAP. So now that the stage is set, I'm gonna invite Bob Greenstein and Secretary Vilsack to the stage for their important conversations uh, on policies to alleviate food insecurity. A quick housekeeping note is under your chairs, you'll find note cards. And at, at the end, we'll open it up to questions and answers. But the way we do questions and answers at the Hamilton Project is uh, we'll have people walking up and down the aisle and you can write your question down on a note card, preferably legibly if you can swing that. And then uh, we'll hand them to the moderator and he'll, he'll sift through and ask questions as so. So Secretary, Bob, welcome. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank Hamilton for having a forum on this very important topic. And there's so many interesting aspects of this that, Mr. Secretary, I want to dig right in. I would like to start by asking you a little bit about the, what you see as the role of the Secretary of Agriculture with respect to these programs and these issues. Let me give a, a little preface. Uh, <clears throat> I remember when I came to Washington in the early 70s, the Secretary of Agriculture was Earl Butts. Uh, some people in the room obviously remember him. Uh, I had the honor of serving in the Food and Nutrition Service in the Carter administration. The Secretary was Bob Berglund, a really terrific guy. But during the 40 plus years I have followed this, the pattern has been that the Secretary is immersed in agriculture policy and for most Secretaries, the food assistance programs are off to the side, they're secondary or they're tertiary. Uh, Bob Berglund was different in that regard, but you, Mr. Secretary, for me, you've broken the mold. I have never seen a Secretary of Agriculture for whom food assistance, hunger, food security, insecurity has been as central as it's been for you. Could you talk a little bit about how you see within the department, for you as the secretary, the, the importance of these programs and the issue of food insecurity. Now, I, I think there's a personal reason for this and then there's a, a policy reason. The personal reason is when uh, you start out life as I did in an orphanage, um, the one thing that you know about yourself uh, is that you were either well-fed or not well-fed. And I can tell you that I have a picture when I was adopted uh, of a very well-fed child. So I know that in the orphanage I was taken care of. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of kids out there who uh, are struggling in families, especially in rural areas. Uh, rural poverty among children is higher than you would expect. One out of four rural kids lives in a, uh, an impoverished home. 
And it's part of the responsibility of the Department of Agriculture to take care of folks, uh, of children and of folks in rural America. Uh, it's a large part of our budget, uh, so clearly we want to make sure that it's operating properly and function uh, the way it should. And unfortunately, in today's world, uh, these programs come under attack. They get mischaracterized. The people who are taking advantage and are benefited from these programs are often uh, demonized. And, and I see it as my responsibility to make sure that the American public understands precisely who it is that's getting these benefits and why, and how it benefits not just the families uh, receiving SNAP, but all of us. Uh, I think it, uh, Bob Rubin alluded to the fact that uh, this is about building a productive economy. Uh, hungry kids aren't going to be uh, learning as well as they should. Uh, they're not going to be as well prepared to, uh, for the competitive economy that they're going to grow up in. Uh, the reality is that families that are struggling with food insecurity have to make very difficult choices. And it impacts the future of kids and it impacts the future of this country. So when you combine that, uh, that aspect with our school lunch program, uh, where we're trying to improve the quality and nutritional value of the school lunch program so our kids actually get well-fed, not just fed, but well-fed. Um, it's an important responsibility uh, for the Department of Agriculture and for the, the person who's in charge of that department. Uh, so from a personal reason, from a policy reason, from a budget reason, it makes sense to pay attention to this. And in this climate in particular, it, it does require a series of champions to make sure that the American public understands precisely how they benefit and why we have these programs. You've particularly been a champion of improving access to the programs by poor people who are eligible for them but have been left out of them. Uh, under your tenure as secretary, the percentage of people eligible for SNAP who actually receive it is at its highest level in the program's history. I think over 80% now of the people 80, eligible. 85%. 85%. <laughs> uh, and in the child nutrition front, with community eligibility. I think your latest innovation is working with states to use Medicaid data to as well as SNAP data to identify children eligible for free or reduced price school meals who aren't getting it. Could you talk a little bit about the emphasis you have placed on improving access? Well, uh, when we first started this process, we took a look at uh, how the states were administering the SNAP program. Uh, the reality is this is a partnership between the federal government and state governments, the states have the responsibility to administer the program. Some states did a better job than others, and we saw some states where the participation rate was in the low 50 percent, uh, which meant that nearly 50 percent of eligible people in a state were not getting the benefits that they were entitled to receive, and the consequences for their families were pretty, uh, pretty dire. Uh, so we started a concerted effort to make sure that people understood at the state level their responsibility to make it easy uh, for people to apply, make it easy for people to understand their benefits. Uh, we started to provide information in Spanish, uh, 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 multiple languages. Uh, and we saw over time, with some pressure on some uh, individual governors, that we saw a spike from 72% overall participation to 85 The one place, Bob, where we have not yet figured out how to crack the nut is with our senior citizens. Yeah. And the reality is the participation rate there is only 41%. And I think a lot of it has to do with how seniors perceive this program. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with how difficult we've made it for seniors. Uh, the reality is we don't really need to be checking income levels of seniors on a regular basis because the, uh, you know, the, the fact is if you're 85 years old, your income is pretty set. You're probably living on a Social Security check. Maybe you've got a small retirement uh, income. That's not going to change. So we're looking now at ways in which we can make it a little <coughs> bit easier for seniors to get into the program and stay in the program to get that number up. Uh, and I think we'll have some success over the course of the next nine months, and hopefully the next administration will see the importance of this. Uh, on the school lunch program, uh, again, the reality is a lot of these school districts have kids who are uh, coming from impoverished neighborhoods, and we require uh, quite an administrative burden, if you think about it, for these schools uh, to get kids eligible for free and reduced lunch. We, we expect that a second grader will take an uh, application home with them in their backpack, that they'll figure and remember to take it out of their backpack, give it to their parents. Their parents will then disclose information that they may be, it may be hard for them to disclose uh, how, how little income they have. It has to then be returned to the second grader. The second grader has to remember to give it to the teacher. The teacher has to give it to the administrative folks at the office so that they can determine whether or not that particular youngster 
is free and reduced lunch. The reality is that doesn't happen as frequently as it should, and kids get left out in the process. But if you're in a school district that has a disproportionate number of, of poor families, then why go through that process? The reality is most kids are going to probably be free and reduced lunch. So we have this community eligibility program where we're now seeing uh, over 18,000 schools, uh, millions of kids who otherwise would not have received assistance are now receiving assistance, and it's not just in schools, Bob, it's also in child care centers. 90,000 child care centers are benefiting from community eligibility. So uh, it's an important program, an important tool uh, to make sure that kids get the, the food they need to be as successful as uh, their talents can take them. I'd like us to get back in a few minutes to community eligibility, but turning back uh, for a little bit to SNAP. So uh, you and I and Bob Rubin, we were talking a little bit just a few minutes ago before the event started about the degree of cynicism in the country uh, among, about, among other things, government and its ability to help. So I remember back in the late 60s when teams of doctors went into Appalachia and the Deep South and found rates of child hunger malnutrition and nutrition-related conditions akin to those in some third world countries. And then the medical researchers went back again in the late 70s after, in the intervening decade, we had had a national food stamp program implemented. President Nixon helped lead the way for national benefit standards. And the researchers said something to the effect of where before we saw large numbers of children with sunken eyes, swollen bellies. We don't see that anymore, and the main reason is the food programs. And I remember they had this line that said, food stamps does more to lengthen and strengthen the lives of our people than any other program. When we look at the data today, uh, Diane, I think it's fact number eight in your report, you talked about the long-term effects, even leading among some children to improvements not just in education, but employment and earnings in adulthood. And the latest data, I think, show that SNAP lifts about 10 million people out of poverty, about 5 million children each year. It, that's about tie with the earned income credit and the child credit. It's more than anything else except Social Security for the population in general. And more children lift it out than, and even than Social Security. I think no program does as much to reduce deep poverty among children from those below half the poverty line as SNAP. So how do we, I don't think this is widely understood. Uh, we still hear the attacks, the program is a hammock. Whereas Diane, your work as reflected in fact number eight, indicates really the reverse. It improves kids' life chances rather than trapping them in a hammock. Not widely understood. What do we do to better communicate these important findings? Well, I think, uh, first of all, it's making sure that uh, Americans understand precisely who's receiving SNAP. Uh, I think there's this tendency to think that most of the people receiving SNAP are gaming a system. Uh, but when you explain to people, as I do often, uh, that 85% of SNAP beneficiaries are either children, senior citizens, people with severe disabilities, or working men and women with children, they all of a sudden have a different attitude about the program. So first, I think educating people about who actually receives SNAP. And secondly, uh, uh, making sure that they understand that this is a supplemental nutrition assistance program. Nobody can survive on SNAP benefits. I mean, the reality is that there is not that much in the benefit that would allow a family of four to be able to buy all of their groceries for, for a month. Uh, and I think one of the things that we ought to be looking at is how we calculate the benefits for SNAP. Uh, we, we base it on, the, on, on a food plan. That food plan really hasn't been adjusted or examined for quite some time. And I think if we did examine it, we would find that the, the benefit is probably inadequate uh, for the purpose of the program. Uh, so, I think we also need to point out that the, the, the benefits that this program has to people outside of the program. So as we look at, for example, agriculture and we look at uh, low commodity prices, the reality is if more people can go into a grocery store and buy more food, that means that they're going to buy more food. Uh, over 90% of SNAP benefits are 
redeemed within 30 days. So the reality have to package more, have to, have to shelve more, have to sell more. All of those are jobs. And we need to make sure that people understand the economic benefits to the, to the community as a whole by having these programs. You know, one of the things I often say to people in this country is that we take our, our, our stability for granted in this country. Yes, we have uh, partisan dif differences, and they sometimes get uh, pretty uh, passionate, but the reality is we're a relatively stable nation. One of the reasons we are is because we have we don't have many 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 hungry people. I mean, we have we have food insecure folks, which means at some point in time in that month they may be hungry, but we don't have anywhere near the level of deep hunger that you see in countries that have great uh, dissatisfaction. So this provides, I think, a, a s stability in our society. So marketing this program, talking about it, not being defensive about it, um, and basically going into uh, into Farm Bureau meetings, uh, into uh, business meetings, and explain to business leaders, uh, agricultural leaders, the benefits of these programs to the country and to themselves uh, as a way of making sure that they understand that there is a, a significant benefit. Now, recent research also shows that kids on SNAP have better health outcomes. So all of us are concerned about health care costs. All of us want to see a transition from a, a sick care system to a wellness system. Well. You can't get to a wellness system unless you have adequate nutrition. So there's an opportunity there also to talk about the impact that SNAP has on improved health outcomes, reducing health care costs overall. So I mean, there are multiple ways of marketing this program uh, and making sure that people understand that it's not really um, a, a, a welfare program per se. It's really a program that makes sure that every one of our kids, every one of our seniors, Every one of our uh, folks who are working hard uh, but just can't, having a hard time making it have enough uh, to basically keep themselves uh, going. And, and, and you know, the, this, this issue of, of senior citizens, I want to make sure everyone understands this. Look, it's, it's in our best interest for that senior to, to be well fed because if they are, they're going to go to the doctor fewer times. They're not going to have the health care consequences either. So all of us benefit from this program, and I think it's important for progressives to be perhaps a bit more vocal about this uh, and a bit more uh, willing to inform people about what this program is and what it isn't. There's also this issue of fraud. Oh my, it just drives you crazy. People say, oh, there's a lot of fraud in this program. The fraud rate in this program is 1.3%. It's the lowest, uh, it's one of the lowest it's ever, of any federal program. The fraud and error rate combined is less than f uh, 5%, which is the lowest it's ever been, ever. So this is not a situation where this program is being uh, taken advantage of. Uh, there are, from time to time, situations, but most often uh, those situations are dealt with. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good program, and we need to be uh, proud of it. Uh, we ought not to be defensive about it. A much dramatically smaller rate of error in fraud than the statistics show we have in the tax code with respect to particularly People don't like to talk about this, but uh, business income, the degree of business income that's never reported, you compare it to the degree of income that's missed in the SNAP program, this is a night and day comparison. Well, I like to talk to our, to, to our, to our farm friends about the fact that the SNAP error rate is lower than the crop insurance uh, fraud rate. Fraud rate's lower uh, SNAP than crop insurance. I'm sure that's popular when you well, say that. <laughs> it makes a point, which is that I think we have to be careful about generalizing about a program based on uh, one or two news uh, broadcasts about an egregious situation, because there are egregious situations in a lot of programs, but we have a lot of hardworking folks at the state and federal level that are keeping those rates uh, si significantly lower than they have been. I want to uh, pick up on something you just said a minute ago. You were talking about how the benefit level was really based on a formula set many years ago. Uh, as I recall, it goes all the way back to the 60s. We had something called the Economy Food Plan. Then it was sort of renamed the Thrifty Food Plan. But uh, for people who don't know, the maximum food stamp benefit level for people with no other disposable income equals the cost of that Thrifty Food Plan in the previous June, I think it is. Uh, and then if you have some income, the benefit's reduced. So. That food plan was designed many decades ago when the norm was that mothers stayed at home. Right. And 
it's based on buying a lot of raw ingredients and cooking food from scratch. Today, we expect mothers, poor mothers with children, we expect them to work, but we still have a food plan in place that kind of assumes they don't. Uh, Diane, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you have a paper, Hamilton is commissioned, looking at this, that you'll be releasing at an event on, is it May 23rd? That's exactly right. Okay, so I'm putting in a little plug for this event on May 23rd, we're gonna, Hamilton's gonna come back to this issue uh, uh, and look at it. You know, when we look at the SNAP program, I, I think you and I and many others were struck at how enormously responsive it was in the Great Recession. I was startled when I looked at the figures on how much less poverty broadly measured, the measures that count SNAP, how much less it rose in the deepest recession since the Great Depression than one would have otherwise realized. And when you dig into the numbers, the enormous responsiveness of SNAP had a lot to do with that. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, we have national benefit standards. Before they came into effect around 1971, we had some states that were cutting people off the program, who, people who worked when their incomes reached 50% of the poverty line, if you were above that. So I, th this is a lead in to something I wanna ask you about. We're in an increasing debate on poverty. Uh, the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, is elevating poverty, which I think is really welcome. We ought to have a vigorous debate. Uh, but in the summer of 2014, he rolled out a plan called an Opportunity Grant that would, have, would take about 11 programs, including SNAP, and allow states to kind of merge them into one big funding stream. We used to call this a mega block grant. I think the Speaker calls it a merged funding stream. It's largely the same thing as far as I can see. But a state gets a fixed dollar amount and could pretty the money wouldn't have to be used on food assistance. It could be, it would be up to the state. It could be used for any of a very broad array of purposes. There would no longer be a national benefit standard or structure. There wouldn't be automatic responsiveness in recession. You were a governor for two terms. I'd be interested in your sense. Would this be a good move for the SNAP program, and in particular, for its purposes, helping low-income families thrive? Or is it a step backward and in the wrong direction? Well, with due respect to the speaker, he has never been a governor, so he doesn't know how governors think. Uh, the reality is that when you have a block grant, uh, it, it basically will fund your priorities, not necessarily the nation's needs. Uh, and. Part of my skepticism about this is it emanates from uh, the program that we have with employment and training in SNAP. That's another thing that people don't realize, that there are limitations on how much uh, people, how long people can receive SNAP if they're able-bodied without dependence. And these limitations are quite severe. In other words, if you're able-bodied, you have to be working or receiving training or education for a certain period of time each month, or you're limited to three months of benefits every 36 months. Now, we give states 100% uh, federal money. Last year it was $320 million. We say to states, here's $320 million, and your job is to take that money and connect the work opportunities that are being created in an improved economy, as unemployment's coming down, jobs are being created, you link the jobs that you know are being created in your state with the SNAP beneficiaries that you also know, who they are and where they are, and give them an opportunity to work their way out of SNAP. Now, you would think that every governor, every conservative governor, would say, this is great. Last year, $92 million was unspent by governors. Now, this is 100% money. This is not requiring a match on the part of states. This is 100% money, and 92 million of it was unspent. And yet you have governors at the same time saying, we need to reduce SNAP, we need to get these people working, so when I hear people talk about block grants, I have deep concerns about precisely what's gonna happen with those resources, how they're going to be utilized and what the oversight is going to be. And I honestly will tell you that if you were to block grant this program, you would have nowhere near the satisfaction in terms of the ability to get money to people quickly, the ability to administer this program fairly easily, 
uh, an 85 percent participation rate. I would guarantee you that we, you would not have an 85 percent participation rate. Uh, and you would have uh, some serious consequences from, from a block grant because it would not be used for the purposes for which it, would be, it was intended. It would be used for the pet project, the pet idea. Uh, I'm all for innovation. I'm all for trying new things. That's why we put $200 million in the farm bill to say to governors, hey, if you want to be innovative about connecting people with employment and training opportunities, here's an opportunity. Apply for this money. Let's see what you can come up with. And if you come up with a great idea, we'll be happy to put more money behind it. We'll see. Uh, we, we have 10 states that are participating in this effort. We'll see what they come up with. Uh, but I will tell you that I, I think block granting these programs, uh, and I, you know, my, my governor colleagues would probably not be happy with this answer, but do not, do not, do not tell me that states are going to use every dime of that appropriately. They, they, <laughs> people talk about states being the, the laboratories of democracy. They're the laboratories of democracy with federal money. And there's often, people often forget that. It's not state money that goes into these great experiments. It's federal dollars. Uh, and uh, there's often not the, 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 the credit that the federal government should get for investing in these innovations. Uh, so I'm, I'm leery about block grants, uh, just simply because I, I haven't seen governors step up. I, I, I alluded earlier, when we came in in 2009, there were states that were, were a little over 50 percent of eligible people were actually receiving SNAP because that particular governor, that particular administration did not care enough to make sure that people knew about these benefits, did not care enough to make sure that the bureaucracy was getting information out in languages that people could understand, did not care enough to simplify the process. So I'm skeptical. Well, one little fact that's consistent with your observations, if you take the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families block grant that was established in 1996 under the welfare law. In the law, its core purposes are employment, child care, and cash assistance for poor families. If you look at the latest data the states themselves have provided to HHS, only 50% of TANF dollars go for those three core purposes. The other 50% have been dissipated all over state budgets. It's kind of sometimes hard to find where they're all going. And in some cases, states were able to take the federal dollars and substitute them for state dollars previously being spent on a low-income service. And then the freed up dollars can go well, wherever you want if you're a governor. That's the game that's played. Or you disproportionately provide administrative expenses out of these programs. I mean, there are a multitude of budget games that you can play. Uh, and that's why it's important, I think, for there to be this partnership between the federal government and the states, because all, very, very frequently we come in to, and, and we review what the states are doing, and if they're not actually doing what they're supposed to be doing, we make them pay the money back. We make them adjust and change their, their programs. Uh, if you block grant this money, you, you're going to lose control of it, and you're not going to see the benefits from it. So a minute ago, you actually anticipated my next question. Could we talk for just a moment about uh, the work demonstrations and, in particular, the requirement that you mentioned for people aged 18 to 50 who aren't disabled and who aren't raising dependents? So there's an interesting history here that I find most people don't remember. When the 96 welfare law, which is where this requirement comes from, was being written, and the final bill had been put together by the Republican Congress at the time, and it was going through the final time. When it got to the House floor, all of a sudden an amendment was offered that had not been anticipated by the bill's authors. And the amendment was one to say that for these people aged 18 to 50, they could only get SNAP for three months while unemployed out of every three years. And the amendment's lead sponsor got up on the floor and said, this is not a harsh provision. Every one of these people will be offered a work slot, a place in a work program or an actual job. And only those who don't take it will be limited to three months out of every three years. Now, I was watching this occur and scratching my head. You looked at the amendment. There were no work slots in it. I think he sincerely thought that somehow the program already had all these work slots. It never did. Um, Bob may remember that when the bill got downtown, I remember Leon Panetta 
President Clinton's chief of staff, saying to me, Bob, I think this three month, and Leon had been Mr. Food Stamps in the House as on the Ag Committee and the Budget Committee. I remember Leon saying, I think this is the most troubling provision in the entire welfare law because it means that people who want to work, search for a job and can't find one, are cut off after three months. And we see that the people who are cut off, their average income is only about 20% of the poverty line. So I guess our task is how do we actually have work opportunities for people, not just cutoffs? And that's what you're trying to find working in partnership with the states in these demonstration projects. So I guess they're just recent, 10 states recently ten, ten underway. States. And it, it reflects the fact that it's all well and good to suggest that you're going to find work slots for folks and you're going to find work. But what if you live in a rural community uh, that's uh, isolated? that you don't have uh, any public transportation system to larger communities, and you don't have a functioning automobile or vehicle. And there are no jobs being created in your small town. They may be being created 50 miles away from where you are. How do you help that person out? Uh, or you're a returning veteran, and you're dealing with the consequences of having experienced the horrors of war, and you're having a hard time adjusting. How do you... How, how do you work through that and still be able to be employed? Or you're a single mom and you've got child care issues and you can't find decent child care. You want to work. You'd, be lo you'd love to work. You want to be uh, self-dependent. Uh, but the reality is you can't find decent child care and you can't afford it for a multitude of reasons. So it, what we're trying to do with this project is to try to figure out what the barriers are and how we can creatively work around them or work through them so that we actually do what we all want done, which is to link people with jobs that are being created in an improved economy with people that can and, and should be working, providing them with skills, making sure that they actually have skills that are marketable, uh, which is a, a training and education component. So we're looking at ways in which states want to be thoughtful, innovative, they want to try something different, we're willing to let them try something different. Maybe it's a, a cash assistance, maybe it's paying for childcare, maybe it's providing transportation, voucher, whatever. It's some process by which we are helping them overcome the barrier. Then we'll determine what's, well, there's a very serious component, evaluation component of this, which will then be used for uh, informing uh, the future direction of that ENT program. I, I think there's a really bright note here. So. The $200 million you're mentioning came out of the farm bill that right. was developed in the 2013, I think finally signed into law early 2014. In the House, there was a very intense and at times partisan debate over these work issues in the SNAP program. But the bright note was that ultimately in conference, there was bipartisan agreement and support for the $200 million demonstration project. And then, after it was enacted, before the demo started, Mr. Secretary, I remember a conversation you and I had, and you said, Bob, we're gonna let flowers bloom. We're gonna let conservative taste states test conservative solutions, progressive states test progressive solutions. The issue isn't the ideology, the issue is what works. And we wanna find out what works and have it inform future policy. We took an additional step after that, uh, which was to establish a center of excellence in, in, in Washington. The state of Washington does a particularly good job on linking these folks uh, with employment opportunities. And we took another nine uh, states and linked them up with this center of excellence. So we actually have 19 states that are working uh, collaboratively on trying to figure out innovative and creative ways to do this better so that we can give states direction. And then my belief is that we should then say, we're happy to continue to give you this 100% money. We're happy to continue to give you the 50-50 money, but we want you to utilize these resources in the most effective and efficient way to connect people with job opportunities. That's the right way to deal with reducing SNAP uh, numbers. I mean, you know, seriously, if people were genuinely interested in reducing SNAP numbers, the simplest and easiest way would be to increase the minimum wage. We know that if you increase the minimum wage, you're going to take millions of people who are currently in SNAP and you're going, to, you're going to put them in a different category. They're going to need less SNAP or in some cases no SNAP at all. So I always say if you're really truly interested in reducing the SNAP numbers, 
Why aren't we debating in the, uh, in the halls of Congress uh, uh, an increase in the minimum wage? Why are we depending on individual cities, counties, and states uh, to have that conversation? I'd also, this isn't a snap issue, but it relates. Uh, I would love to see us at some point looking more at subsidized jobs. We had a subsidized jobs program. They're mostly in the private sector as part of the Recovery Act. And within a year, there were 250,000 job slots for people who otherwise couldn't get hired. Uh, Republican governors were as enthusiastic as Democratic ones. Haley Barber of Mississippi supported it. And in the uh, AEI Brookings report on poverty that came out in December, there was a bipartisan recommendation to look at a subsidized jobs program. As you say, jobs and wages are the way to... Well, and we should be looking at the unemployment uh, compensation system yeah. to ask ourselves, is that the right model for the 21st century? Are there ways in which that could be modernized, ways in which we could try something different? But at the end of the day, just summarily reducing SNAP numbers by creating uh, impossible goal uh, standards in terms of people's access to jobs uh, when you aren't uh, providing and not taking full advantage of the resources as states are. Um, you know, and, and you know, states, uh, on, on another nutrition issue, when we set up the school lunch program, we also provided states with resources to administer that program, the new, pro the, the new standards, and many states left money on the table in terms of that program as well. So it goes back to the block grant issue. I mean, if they're not utilizing the resources that are available to them because they don't like a program or they don't philosophically agree with the program, how can you trust them with a block grant? So let's indeed turn briefly to child nutrition. <clears throat> a disappointing development this morning. Uh, yesterday, the uh, chair of the subcommittee in the House that has jurisdiction over the child nutrition programs released a draft child nutrition bill. In the Senate, the Senate Ag Committee negotiated a bill on a bipartisan basis. It's, it's not a perfect bill. It's a bipartisan compromise. Uh, but I think overall it's a, it's a step forward and it's bipartisan. We're not yet at the bipartisan stage in the House. I hope we get there. But the bill that was uh, released yesterday, uh, just, I was just looking at it this morning. Uh, you talked earlier a few minutes ago about community eligibility. Uh, uh, people on, on my staff who really know these numbers have looked at it and tell me that the draft bill or the bill just introduced would take community eligibility. This is a program under which schools in high poverty areas can serve breakfast and lunches free, save the money on all the paperwork of the applications, and reach all the kids where we always miss some kids when you have to do all the paperwork. That, that this bill would reduce from 18,000 to 11,000. It would take 7,000 schools that are already doing community eligibility and bar them from doing it in the future. There are more than 3 million kids in those schools. So I was disappointed to see that provision, but I, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the bill yet or if you've thought about well, it. Well, you should feel better about the fact that virtually everyone that is paying attention to this issue does not like that provision. From the School Nutrition Association, uh, to uh, the folks at USDA, uh, to advocates uh, for uh, better uh, uh, child uh, uh, nutrition. Uh, no one likes that provision because everyone sees the wisdom of having a community eligibility program that reduces the administrative burden of, of schools at a time when they are, would like to redirect those resources into improving the quality of the meals or expanding a school breakfast program that didn't exist before or figuring out ways in which they can provide uh, healthier snacks. At the end of the day, that's not a very good provision, and I, I can't imagine that at the end of the day it will be ultimately part of a final bill. Uh, and if it were, I, I would uh, strongly encourage the, the, the president to take a very, very serious look at the bill. Uh, I don't think the president's interested in uh, ha having hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of kids disenfranchised from a program that is designed to help them uh, make sure that they have adequate nutrition during the day. And I think we all hope that ultimately we get a bipartisan bill that you look at and you say, I can recommend a signature on, but we have a process to go through to get there. We're, we're not there yet, that's for sure, on the House side. The Senate, you know, they worked hard. They worked. They, they did listen to one another. Uh, they did find a way to, to increase uh, our summer feeding program. We haven't had a chance to talk about that, but 
Uh, that's a program I think that's equally important and there needs to be focus on it because the reality is kids are only in school for 180 days. They're out of school for the rest of, uh, of the year. And the reality is during that period of time, if, unless we have a, a more aggressive programs, there are uh, many, many kids who, who are very food insecure during those summer months, during weekends and during vacations. We, we should note fact number 11 in the Hamilton document uh, cites, really, if you look at this fact, dramatic, the results are dramatic on the degree to which what's called summer EBT, which is enhanced nutrition benefits for children in the summer months when they don't get free or reduced price meals, uh, the, the data on the degree to which it helps on the food security front is quite dramatic. And Mr. Secretary, maybe you could say a word. You have a terrific provision, in my view, in the President's budget on summer EBT. Could you talk about that? We do. That? And, and I think, first of all, given the current state of that program, I'm proud of the fact that we've improved the number of meals served from the summer of 2009 to last summer by 26 million additional meals. We're serving another half a million more kids than we did uh, in 2009. That's the good news. The difficult news is that roughly 20 to 21 million kids currently participate in free and reduced lunch. During our summer feeding programs, we are probably feeding about 4 million people, 4 million children. So the reality is there's a significant delta between what we are doing during the school day and what we're doing during the summer months. One way to address that delta would be to provide uh, parents uh, and children uh, this EBT card, uh, just similar to a, a SNAP card that they could use to it's kind of a debit card, a debit card, which uh, which they could use to be uh, to purchase additional uh, additional food. Now, why is it important to have this program? It's important because there are many people uh, who don't live near a summer fe uh, feeding site. Uh, these are congregate sites. Uh, they may be living in a remote rural area. They may be living in an inner city where, where it's difficult to get to where the summer feeding program is operating. Uh, this would give uh, families the ability to purchase additional food during that summer month so that their kids would be uh, better fed. Uh, that would allow us, with the President's proposal, over the next 10 years to gradually increase the number of children uh, that we would be covering to ultimately get to the entire 20 to 21 million kids being uh, having access to, to food throughout the entire year. Uh, the President's budget proposes this 10-year ramp up. Uh, were it to be passed by the Congress, we would see an additional million kids next summer. Uh, receiving the benefits of the President's program. I, I just want to note I, something I've also said on other occasions. Yes, this is the final budget of President Obama. And a proposal like your robust summary BT proposal, it isn't going to happen this year. But I can't remember, it's been a long time since I've seen a budget from a President that has as many interesting, innovative, I think important new proposals to deal with poverty as this budget does. And from a poverty standpoint, I'm hoping people see it as a vision for the future and whoever the next president is, that they look at a number of your proposals, including the summer EBT proposal, as starting points for when they think about developing the first budget for the next administration. Well, this is a president who grew up relying in part on some of these very same programs. So the question you, know, you, would, you would have to have <clears throat> to, to Congress is, what future president are you going to uh, limit today? A kid who's living in a rural area today could be a president 20, 20 years, 25, 30 years from now, uh, needs the benefit of these programs. So the reality is that there are millions of kids. And we know that if they don't they don't eat right during the summer, they're not as well prepared to begin school in August and September. So that means that they'll be a step or two behind. If they're a step or two behind at the beginning of the year, maybe they won't do very well. Maybe if they don't do very well, maybe they get uh, disinterested in school, eventually they drop out. And you know what? We end up, uh, in many cases, unfortunately, uh, then feeding these people three meals a day in a confined facility called a prison. I mean, it makes no sense for us to shortchange our kids. Um, it's in our long-term best interest, including theirs, to invest in them, to make sure that they're well-fed and well-educated and well-prepared. If they are, more times than not, they're going to succeed. And so the fact that we have 16, 17 million kids today who in the summer struggle to find uh, adequate nutrition is, as Bob Rubin suggests, in the richest country in the world, morally uh, 
unacceptable. We're going to go in just a second to questions and answers from the audience. Before we do, I... Yeah, the answers are coming to the audience, too. That's great. I, I, I can leave. It's fabulous. I like this. But before we do, one more question. So clearly, these programs are critically important. And by the same token, we can't, not only can we not totally eliminate poverty, we're not going to totally eliminate food insecurity just through the food assistance programs. You've mentioned employment. You've mentioned the minimum wage. I think you referred to child care. You're the head of the White House, I think you're the chair of the White House Rural Council. Right. You look at issues affecting particularly low-income families in rural areas across the country. Could you talk to us a little bit about hunger, food insecurity, poverty, from a larger rural perspective and how you think about that and the kinds of things you would like to see the nation and policymakers move towards from that perspective? Well, look, 85% of the persistently poor counties uh, in this country where poverty rates are in excess of 20, 25, 30% are rural. Uh, when you add that to the fact that one out of every four rural kids lives in poverty, it is a compelling case for the federal government and for all governments to be focused on trying to make that, those numbers improve. So I advised the president of these numbers, and he suggested that the rural council would be an appropriate place for us to look at innovative, creative uh, ways to deal with this. So we have now a rural impact effort, uh, which is focused on child poverty. And we have identified uh, 10 uh, communities in the country that are looking at what is referred to as a two-generation approach to poverty, uh, not just uh, focusing employment and training programs in one place and child care, uh, early childhood, preschool opportunities for uh, poor kids in another place, but actually taking all of the programs and focusing them on the family, dealing with at simultaneously with mom and dad and child. Uh, and we're doing this in 10 different communities in 10 different ways to see how we might learn better <coughs> how to utilize programs. This program is also designed uh, to make sure that we do a better job of educating people about the availability of programs. We find in rural communities in particular, they may not be fully aware of the programs that are in fact in, in place, nor do they have necessarily uh, the sophistication in working through the federal uh, maze uh, to be able to take advantage of those programs. And so we are really focusing on a series of place-based initiatives. Uh, the Department of Agriculture started Strike Force, where we're taking all of our mission areas, we put a team together, we go down in these persistently poor areas, we link up with a community building organization, we have over 1,500 partners now, and we say, what, how can we help? We've, we've made over 190,000 investments in those communities, over $26 billion, and we're beginning to see them understand how to play the game, how to access these programs. Uh, Bob, I think one thing that this country needs to do is it has to have a separate strategy for rebuilding and revitalizing the rural economy. Uh, production agriculture has been incredibly effective and innovative. Uh, when I was born in 1950, there were 25 million farmers. Uh, today, there are less than 3 million. In fact, uh, if you look at the folks who produce 85% of our food, it's probably 250 to 300,000 people. Uh, the reality is we didn't complement that economy, that production agricultural economy, with other natural resource-based economies that would allow for opportunities for people to do well in rural areas. We are doing this now. We have the local and regional food system. We have conservation and ecosystem markets. We've got the bio-based manufacturing economy. We're trying to rebuild the economy in rural areas. And if you rebuild it, create better paying jobs, more, more market opportunities for uh, farm families, more opportunities for small and mid-sized operations. You'll see a decline in poverty in those rural areas. You'll see more opportunity. You'll see uh, less pressure on cities uh, because people won't feel compelled to move to cities. Uh, and I think you'll see less need for the very programs we're talking about here. But you have to build the economy. You have to have a strategy. And you have to direct the resources uh, in support of that strategy. And frankly, until um, uh, this administration, I'm not sure that we had a defined, focused, comprehensive strategy uh, focused on a very important part in a place called rural America. I'll just give you one statistic about rural America. I want you all to think about this. It's 15% of America's population, but it's nearly 40, 35 to 40% of America's military. So if you want young men and women being willing to serve their country, 
then you better be paying attention to this part of the country because a disproportionate number of those young men and women come from rural America. And if there's no economic opportunity, if there's no hope, if there's no brighter tomorrow, these kids are going to move uh, and they may, may or may not be willing to uh, serve their country and, def and, and to defend us. It's a value system I think is important and frankly, um, I will say people in my party uh, have not spoken as effectively as I think they need to to the folks in those rural areas. Okay, we're going to go now to questions. We have a number of interesting questions from the audience. So first, how have you worked to reduce the historic stigma associated with SNAP participation? A couple of ways. One, uh, I mentioned earlier, basically advising people and educating people uh, through a variety of, uh, of methods who actually is receiving SNAP and talking about the economic benefits uh, in a recessionary time, talking about the jobs that are connected. The second thing we've done is we've tried to integrate uh, the SNAP families into the, in, into the sort of the general flow uh, of the economy. The EPT card that we've talked about before uh, is allowed us to move away from the food stamp uh, notion uh, allows folks to be in that grocery line, and you may or may not be aware of where the, that you're in line with somebody who's a, a SNAP beneficiary. Uh, we've also tried to create opportunities for those folks to participate in other venues. Uh, we've expanded the EPT access in farmers markets. Now over 6,400 farmers markets can take the EPT card. We're working with foundations to increase the availability of, of uh, healthy fruits and vegetables uh, for SNAP families. Um, and so Part of it is, is, is better integration and better education about um, who's receiving SNAP. I, I must say, I think the EBT card is really important. I mean, for decades and decades, when you went through the checkout line, you had to pull out your coupon book, rip out your food stamps, coupons. Everybody could see you doing it. The EBT card looks like any other debit card that any other, anybody else has right. in line. And, um, it's hard for me to imagine that if the level of stigma had stayed the same as it was, particularly back when we had food stamp coupons, if that were the case, we wouldn't have an 85% participation rate today with 45 million people benefiting. I think that's prima facie evidence, not that we're all the way there, but that there has been a significant reduction in stigma. I, I think so, and, and I think, uh, again, if we, uh, if we do a better job with our senior citizens, I think we'll see uh, better understanding of precisely who's benefiting from this program, and I think that also will help reduce it a bit. The next question is really interesting. Do you think that SNAP results in low-income wage suppression, that it leads to employers paying workers lower wages? Um, you know, I'm not willing to, to, to believe that there are a significant number of people who sit in the back room of their operation uh, and who, who sort of do a calculation. Uh, so I don't think it, it, it I, I think if there is any wage suppression, it is primarily unintentional, not an intentional decision-making process. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I can't imagine that that's how, I, I would hope that that's not how people think. So I, th this is actually something I've, I've been quite interested in. To the best of my knowledge, Diane can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not aware of a single uh, peer-reviewed academic study that finds such an effect. And there are some reasons for this. If you're a, an employer and you have a worker, you may know, you know the wage you're paying that worker, but you don't necessarily know, uh, is there a spouse or a cohabitant in the household who all has a well-paying job? You don't know which of your employees are receiving SNAP and which are not. And no employer could run an operation where they pay two employees doing the exact same job a different wage level because one's getting SNAP and one isn't. It doesn't work that way. The, the only evidence I'm aware of is not in the SNAP program. There's uh, one or two studies that find that because the earned income tax credit has a really positive effect we all like of inducing more people to enter the labor market, 
that by increasing the supply, the supply of workers looking for jobs, it may have some modest moderating effect, small, uh, on wages. Uh, the overall effect of the EITC on workers' incomes is a huge positive. But to me, this is also one of the reasons that the minimum wage and the EITC complement each other. The EITC brings more people into the labor market, an adequate minimum wage puts a, a, a floor below which the wages can't go. But I have never seen any evidence, Diane's agreeing, uh, that the SNAP program, the SNAP program the, the, unlike the EITC, it, it, it doesn't have particular effects on the supply of labor. Oh, here's an interesting question. Is SNAP being ignored in the presidential election? And if so, why? Uh, I don't think it's being ignored uh, in the sense that I think there has been uh, a good deal of conversation about uh, poverty, uh, about income inequality. I know that uh, coming from Iowa, I obviously watched the presidential campaign begin, and I know that there was a great deal of conversation about uh, economic opportunity, uh, support for programs uh, that would provide people a chance to make it. Uh, so I'm not sure it's being uh, ignored uh, by the candidates. It may very well be not something that the media is focused on uh, because uh, it, uh, they're more interested in the theatrics of the campaign. Uh, but I guess that's a polite way of <laughs> referring to what's going on. Uh, it, it, it's not as, uh, but maybe doesn't sell as much advertising as, uh, you know, as some of the stuff that is being reported. I, you know, honestly, I think um, we, we really should demand more from our presidential campaigns, not, not, not from candidates, but from the campaigns and the coverage of the campaigns. Because there are a lot of issues that aren't necessarily being discussed as they ought to be or in a, in a serious manner, like the conversation we're having today. I, I think of rural poverty. There, there, I think there are a couple of candidates who have uh, fairly detailed plans about rural poverty, but there hasn't been a conversation about it. And it, frankly, is a fairly important topic uh, that needs to be discussed. I, I also suspect, it wouldn't surprise me if we see a little more focus on SNAP in the general election, but we're now in the primary stage, it's not as though there is a burning issue about SNAP that divides Donald Trump and Ted Cruz, nor similarly Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. It could be that when we get to the general election, there are bigger differences and that one or the other party's candidate Elevates well, there'll be an effort, as there was in 2012, when references were made to President Obama as the food stamp president. There'll be references to, to do it in a way that isn't informative. It's not a discussion. It is a, an effort to demonize not just the SNAP beneficiaries, but also the candidate uh, who believes that there is a reason and a, an appropriate place for the SNAP program. Yeah. And if that occurs, there should be some serious pushback by not just the candidate that, that it has to deal with this, but by those of us who understand what this program is and what it isn't. Uh, we should not let anyone suggest that there are people, uh, you know, rampant fraud and waste and abuse in the program. We should not allow people to suggest that everyone on SNAP is gaming the system. We should make sure that there's an understanding that there are senior citizens, people with disabilities, working poor, and children, and ask the question, which one of those groups do you not want to help? so that we put that candidate who's suggesting that there's a problem with the SNAP program on, on record as to say, well, I, you know, I, don't want, I don't want seniors to be helped. I don't want people with disabilities to be helped. I don't want kids to be helped. That, that's the kind of debate, if we're going to have that kind of conversation, that's a question we should absolutely compel an answer to. Next question, I'm going to ask the question, but then give a little context. Okay. Has USDA considered eliminating the five-year residency requirement for recent immigrants to receive SNAP. Historical backdrop. Looking as Bob will remember, 
When the 96 welfare law came out of Congress, uh, it had really severe restrictions on legal. We're not talking about undocumented immigrants here. We're talking about legal immigrants, on legal immigrants receiving SNAP and other benefits. And I remember that when President Clinton signed the law, he singled out two areas that he said, in his view, went much too far. And one was the immigrant restrictions, and the other were actually some of the SNAP cuts. Uh, and with regard to the immigrant restrictions, in the 1997 Balanced Budget Act, as, as I recall, the restrictions on legal immigrants receiving food stamps were removed for all of the legal immigrants already here in the country. But for people who newly entered the country after the bill's signature date, August 22, 96, uh, there was a, a five-year restriction. I think it was eased for children subsequently, but I think it's still there for adults. But this is not something you as the secretary have authority on. Congress would have to change the law, would right. they not? Right, and I, our focus obviously is on things that we can control. We can control uh, encouraging states to do a better job of outreach to make sure that eligible people sign up. We can control encouraging uh, opportunities for SNAP beneficiaries to be able to take uh, their kids to the farmer's market and enjoy that experience. We can control uh, reducing error rates and fraud rates. We can control uh, helping states do a better job of connecting people with work opportunities. So our focus is on things we can control. Uh, you know, I don't know that we necessarily have been uh, in the vanguard uh, at this point of, of figuring out what the policy changes ought to be. I think as we begin preparing for the next farm bill, that's when that conversation would be appropriate. So the next secretary will obviously be engaged in it. Uh, to the extent I had a conversation about SNAP in the, in the context of the 2014 farm bill, it was in, in connection with the employment and training, suggesting the $200 million uh, fund to create new innovative ways to find out how we could link people with employment. And as we also know, when you take on really hot button issues, there's to some degree you have to pick your spots. I remember back in 1996, I thought that the immigrant provisions were, without close compare, the most unsavory provisions of the law. And I was very glad that they were substantially altered, although not totally altered, in 1997. But in terms of the Obama administration, obviously the immigrant-related issue the president has elevated is the executive order to bring four or five million people out of the shadows. And I would have to say, much as I would like to see the five-year restriction eased, I think the president got it exactly right. I think the top priority in this area is to bring people out, people who've been here, they've been working, they've been playing by the rules to bring them out of the shadows. And we're still waiting to hear where the Supreme Court will come down on well, this. The next time any of you put a fork into a fruit or vegetable, understand the likelihood is that that fruit and vegetable was touched at some point in time by immigrant hands. And probably 70 to 75% of farm workers are probably not in this country legally but they do backbreaking work in order to provide us this incredible diversity. So when you walk into a grocery store, make sure you understand that amazing diversity you see in the produce department. Part of it was brought to you by folks who work 12, 14 hour days without much protection because they are here just trying to take care of their families and we have a broken immigration system and apparently don't have the courage at this point in time in the Congress to fix it. So we've been talking about big issues. We just got into immigration. An argument can be made, I would agree with this argument, that the biggest issue of all for the future of the planet is climate change. We have a question, how will food insecurity be affected by climate change if we don't address it? I have to say, not something I really know about? Well, the first thing we can do if we're really truly interested in, in climate and, and food insecurity is to eliminate food waste. Thirty percent of all the food that is uh, grown in this country and globally is wasted. 
Uh, in the United States, it is a, a large amount of the uh, solid waste that goes into our landfills. In fact, it's the single biggest uh, solid waste component of landfills and a producer of methane. So if we were able to reduce and eliminate global food loss and waste, we would have enough food to feed 850 million people who are food insecure in the world today. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to, is to work with agriculture to make sure that we are adapting and mitigating uh, to the impacts of climate because there is no question it will impact and affect what's grown, where it's grown, and how much we grow. Uh, and if you happen to be in a coastal area, uh, it's a serious consequence. Uh, when we went to, when I went with uh, President Obama to Cuba uh, for my second visit, I had a chance to visit with the Ag Minister in Cuba, and we believe that there is an opportunity for collaboration uh, on uh, agriculture in the Caribbean. We have a series of uh, climate hubs that we established at the USDA that is actually taking a look at every region of the country and the Caribbean to figure out precisely the impacts of climate change and what we think the vulnerabilities are both in terms of agricultural production and forestry. And then we have produced a series of suggestions in terms of adaptation and mitigation strategies uh, and are using extension to get our producers aware of uh, steps that they can take. And we have linked that effort with a, uh, the Climate Smart Agriculture Alliance, which is now over 100 organizations and countries, uh, working collaboratively to figure out the best practices. So there, there is an aggressive effort here where we're sharing research uh, we're opening up data so that it's easier for people to do research from the research we've done in the past. So there is a significant focus on this at USDA, and we'll continue to focus on it. Uh, but each one of us can start today by trying to avoid food waste. We're now at the end of our hour. Uh, for people here in the audience and any people watching, you've just really seen the seriousness and the words that come to my mind are the quiet but very real passion of Tom Vilsack, the Secretary of Agriculture. For people who are cynical about our political system and our leaders, I think you've just seen over the past hour an illustration that our system can and does produce leaders who really dedicate themselves to making our country and our world a better place. We really thank you, Mr. Secretary, both for being here for the hour, making the time, but more broadly, for everything you're doing on these issues. I want to thank the Hamilton Project for putting this together and all of you for coming here this morning. Thank you.